Hello everyone. As promised, I want to talk about the uh, second mechanism for gyroscopes, which is based on the Coriolis force. And this kind of gyroscopes are what we call a Coriolis effect gyroscope, or we call them vibrating structure gyroscope. And they are MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. Okay, so uh, we want to see this kind of gyroscopes, how they work, and their look is something like this. You see a simple chip like that, and you might wonder, yeah, there could be no uh, gimbal or something inside this one, so how can this possibly measure angular uh, velocity, right? So inside of that, you'll see uh, basically MEMS structures like this, right? You see small basically vibrating elements like that. There are lots of components. And uh, here is a simplified schematic of that. And these pictures on the top are taken from advancednavigation.com and the rest of them are taken from Google and Wikipedia, especially this guy here. So we're gonna analyze this uh, single simplified system here, right? And we're going to see how this system vibrates and how it can potentially measure the angular velocity here based on the Coriolis effect. Okay, so this system that you see down here, this one has um, basically two degrees of freedom per mass. So here you have three masses, mass M3, which is attached to what this is the outer frame that basically this guy here, this is attached to the object that is going to spin. Then inside of that, uh, we have this mass M2, right, which you can see in yellow. And this one, we call it the um, inner frame, right, here. And this inner frame is attached to the uh, outside mass by four horizontal springs with, uh, let's say they are all constant K1. They could be different, but here for simplicity, we assume they are all the same. And then inside of this uh, inner frame, you have this mass M1, which we call the proof mass. And proof mass is attached to the inner frame through these four vertical uh, springs K2. Again, they can be different, but we assume that they are the same. So this is the structure. So inside this uh, case, inside the shell, there are two masses, M1 and M2, attached by a bunch of springs. And in this case, in the physical case of it, the springs are basically, you can see the attachments are through these uh, members that are in contact with each other. So they can represent the springs for you. Okay, and in general, the rotation could be, so these two are not exactly the same, okay? These two are not exactly the same. So here, uh, basically, it's this guy here in the middle that can rotate and that can move, right? It can go up and down and it can rotate, it can have motion. Here is a little bit different, but overall, this is the structure. So uh, since there is rotation here and there is a radial distance, so each member has a radial distance from the center, which we show by R. And as it rotates from here to here, it has this other degree of freedom, theta. So the coordinate system that we are using is R theta, or the uh, polar coordinate. And so you have two unit vectors, right? We have ER in the radial direction outward, and E theta which in this case is perpendicular to uh, ER in the direction of increase of theta. Okay, so each mass has two degrees of freedom, R1, R2, R3, theta1, theta2, and theta3. And we're going to see how Coriolis effect do its job here. The relative motion between M1 and M2, which is in this direction, uh, as we care about mostly, the difference between R1 and R2, is what we call the drive axis, and I'll tell you why, and the relative motion between M2 and M3, which is mostly uh, in this direction we measure it, we call it the sense axis. Okay, so let's go forward and see what happens. So physically, when the block starts to rotate with the object, what happens is, so this is that omega equals theta 3, 
dot, right? The angle of the outer frame. This is what we want to measure. And as you can see, when it starts to move in the beginning, the proof mass is in the middle, almost in the middle of the um, inner frame. As it starts to move, since this mass falls behind, right, because first the M3 starts to rotate, then M2, then M1. So uh, M1 in the E theta direction will fall behind. So you see it gets closer to the left wall. And also, uh, since this uh, centrifugal uh, force, or let's say the springs are not as strong as the bolt connections here for um, M3, right? Here you have bolted down M3, so it can easily have centripetal motion. It can have this acceleration in, uh, inward. But uh, for inner mass, that force does not exist, right? There is not so much force in the radial direction. So M2 starts to go radially out, and also for M1, since these springs are not as strong as the force they provide, they are not as strong as these bolt forces, so M1 also starts to radially go out, right? So uh, between these two positions, you see that the proof mass inside the inner frame starts to go what? It starts to go up and down, as well as what? As well as going left and right. So it shows both of the degrees of freedom. So you see in one step here, it is on this uh, top left corner. In another instance, it is what? In the bottom right corner. So it moved to the right and it moved down. And then next, again, as it keeps rotating, if you draw another one of these, right here, where this guy is kind of like there, further rotated, right? So you can see that, again, this mass comes back here, right? So it keeps doing those two relative motions inside the inner frame, okay? If you go to this um, advancednavigation.com, it has some uh, beautiful animation. Let me show you that. Here, look. I really like this website. It's basically selling their components, right? But here they showed an animation of this and the picture was really good. So I decided to uh, borrow their pictures. So the credit goes to them. They did not explain any formula or anything, but their animation was really good. Okay, so you see down here, there is no explanation, but uh, this is really a, a great animation that they put in there. So uh, here, if we go back, let me explain now physically what is happening because this is really good for vibrations. So here uh, we are going to draw the free body diagram for both the proof mass and the inner frame to see what happens. So this is the uh, inner frame and this is the proof mass. Each one has their own degree of freedom, right? So this guy moves in this direction with uh, R2 and moves in this direction with uh, theta 2, right? And this one goes with um, R1 and in this radial direction and angular direction by theta 1, okay? And what are the forces on them? The forces, if you look, between the M3 and M2, you have these um, horizontal, or in the theta direction, K1s. So if uh, M3 also, we don't need M3 FBD, but if M3 degrees of freedom are shown by R3 and theta 3, then in the uh, radial direction, how much does uh, this mass move? You know, based on the, um, uh, if these angles are small, so here we assume that the angles are small. We want to get linear equations. So we assume that theta one and theta two and theta three are what? They are uh, small angles, okay? We assume that they are small. If that's the case, then this horizontal displacement in this direction can be approximated by R3 theta 3 or R3 sine of theta 3, right, or tangent of theta 3. But again, since it's a small sine and tangent are the same as the angle. 
And similarly for this one, this displacement can be R2 theta 2. Right? So if you look at these springs here, this end of it, this end moves uh, a distance of R3 theta 3, and this end it moves what? R2 theta 2. So if we assume theta 3 is bigger than theta 2, then the difference between these two multiplied by k1 is the force that is applied to what? Applied to the um, uh, proof mass uh, by what? By uh, all of these four springs on the left and right. So the total force on this guy to the right is going to be 4 times k1 times r3 theta 3 minus r2 theta 2 right and that is this force that you'll see later now what else in the vertical direction you have this displacement and this displacement where this displacement as we called it is r2 the other one is r1 so the difference between R2 and R1 is the uh, radial displacement. And here, if we assume R2 is bigger than R1, then uh, 4 times K2 times R2 minus R1 is going to be applied upward to M1. And opposite of that is going to be applied downward to what? To M2. So you're going to have this force down here and this reaction down there. And both of these forces, as I said, are 4 times K2 times R2 minus R1. And that is this force here with negative sign for uh, the uh, inner frame and positive here for the proof mass. Okay, so these are the free body diagrams of these two objects. And here we assume that the displacements are from uh, basically a static position. So whether this is installed vertical, if it's installed horizontally on a horizontal object, then uh, gravity has no effect because it's going to be in, inside the plane or outside the plane here. But if it is installed on a vertically spinning object, then we assume that uh, all the uh, values are measured from static equilibrium, so uh, gravity has no effect. Okay, right? So now, here, we're going to write the equations of motion you know that m times a uh, equals f, right? And here we break it down into radial direction and theta direction. For radial direction, this is acceleration in the radial direction. If you remember from dynamics, right? R double dot minus R theta dot squared, right? This is the radial acceleration uh, just due to R. This is the centripetal component. In the theta direction, a theta equals R theta uh, double dot, which is that tangential component, plus 2r dot theta dot, and this guy here is your Coriolis acceleration. Okay, so we say uh, mar equals fr, and uh, ma theta equals sum f theta. Now, for uh, object 1, as you can see in the theta direction, there is no force, so sum theta force equals zero in the radial direction is equal to this guy. And that's exactly what you can see in these two equations here and here. For the inner frame in the radial direction, the force is equal to a negative 4 K2 times R2 minus R1, as you can see in the radial and in the tangential in the theta direction. Is this 4k1 r3 theta 3 minus r2 theta 2? Okay, so and each one has its own mass and its own degrees of freedom r1, r2, m1, m2, theta 1, theta 2. So you get these uh, the four equations on the left side. Okay, now here we are going to take some terms to the other side. What terms? Let's take a look. So here, I'm going to take this uh, centripetal term here, m1, r1, theta1, dot squared, to the other side. 
And here, I'm going to take this Coriolis term to the other side, 2m1 r1 dot theta 1 dot, so it becomes negative. Similarly, on the bottom one, I do a similar thing. So I bring the centripetal and Coriolis to the other side. And this guy here, this force that appears radially out, it's an inertial force. This is your what? This is your centrifugal force. Let me write it down. This is your centriwatt fugal. And here on this side, if you remember, we call it centripetal force. So you see centrifugal and centripetal are not two different forces. <laughs> they are the same thing. If you keep it as a required acceleration times its mass on the left side, then we call it centripetal force or centripetal acceleration. Let's call it acceleration, really, not force. Or if you take it to the other side and treat it as a force, it's not a force. It's just an acceleration term multiplied by a mass taken to the other side, then you might consider it a force that has no physical entity uh, uh, creating it, right? This force does not come from anything. It just comes from motion. So it's what we call an inertial force, right? And they are the same thing, okay? So you see that uh, they are the same thing. Okay, fine. Uh, so you get these, uh, if you take those, you get these equations on the right-hand side, right? You get these equations here, these ones. Now, let's look at what, let's look at a, a simple solution to this. And I'm not really solving them. I just want to tell you what happens physically. Why do you get this kind of motion, right? And why that kind of motion can be used to measure what this omega or theta 3 dot. Where does that come from? So here, let's look at a specific scenario. Since we bolted down this guy, right? Since we bolted down this outer frame onto the uh, platform that is spinning, this distance R3 here, this distance R3, that is uh, going to be constant, right? It's not going to change, right? This is bolted down radially. So R3 is not going to change, so it's constant. And uh, initially, R3, R2, and R1 are not equal to zero. Actually, they are all the same, right? You see R1, R2, and R3, all of them are in the beginning in the same area right and so they are all the same in the beginning and clearly they are not equal to zero they are equal to this installation radius okay so that is this one also let's assume all angles we start at zero so we start all of them at this vertical position it doesn't really matter then let's assume that uh, theta 3 dot is, of course, not equal to zero. In this case, let's assume it's constant. So let's assume that it is going to spin at the what? At a, a constant RPM that we are going to measure. Okay? Not equal to zero, of course. Now, in the beginning, in the beginning, of course, uh, your uh, inner mass and your uh, inner frame and your proof mass have not started to rotate yet so their angular velocities in the beginning has to be zero you're starting from rest as well as their radial displacements r1 dot and r2 dot they have to uh, start from rest okay so we start our motion from what from rest so what happens here physically let's take a look so if I call this equation, equation 4, let's give them some numbers, 3, 2, and 1. In equation 2, in the beginning, r2 dot and theta 2 dot are 0, so this whole thing is 0, right? And uh, theta 2 is also 0 in the beginning, but theta 3, although in the beginning is 0, but a fraction of a second after the start, Theta 3 is not going to be 0 anymore because theta 3 dot is not 0. 
So in a fraction of a second afterwards, theta 3 is going to be what? It is going to be theta 3 dot, which is a constant, as we said, times t, plus its initial value, which could be 0. So as soon as uh, the time starts to go any uh, small fraction of a second after 0, your theta 3 is not going to be 0 anymore, as long as t is bigger than 0. So this guy is not going to be 0, therefore, while uh, the outer frame starts to move to the right, the inner frame is not moved to the right. There is no theta for that. Therefore, this guy is going to be what? This guy is going to be uh, bigger than zero. This guy is going to be equal to zero. So this springs K1 will be activated because now the displacement on their two ends are not equal to each other. Okay? Once that happens, that radial force, this uh, horizontal forces here, or in the theta direction, will not be zero. Therefore, what happens is your theta two double dot will not be equal to zero anymore. Okay, so the immediate aftermath of this is your theta two double dot is now not going to be equal to zero. That means now you're going to get theta two dot in the next time frame right in the next time frame so this is in the first sample time right let's say in uh, if you do simulations in uh, t equal or bigger than t where t here is the sample time in the first sample time one times t your theta three is not going to be zero which means your um, theta two double dot in the first sample is not going to be zero in the next sample time, t equal 2t, right, or bigger than equal to t, your theta 2 dot is not going to be 0 because the acceleration exists. Okay, so now your theta 2 dot is not going to be 0, but of course it is, lag it is dragging behind theta 3 a little bit because theta 3 started earlier, right? So this spring force exists, right? Your r dot is still 0, but your theta 2 dot is not 0 anymore. So now let's look to equation 3. This time, remember your R2 in the beginning is not 0, right? Here. And now your theta 2 dot is not 0 anymore. So now, what does it mean? Your mass of M2 is started to spin. Your mass M2 is spinning. So... If you look at centrifugal force, there will be a centrifugal force outward for it. So the um, proof mass starts to radially go a little bit outward. Right? So this force is not going to be zero anymore. When that force is not zero, although this guy could be zero in the beginning because R1 and R2 are the same, right? If they are. Uh, then that means R2 double dot is now not going to be zero, right? So that means what? That means your R2 double dot now is not going to be equal to zero. If that's the case, if we go to the next time point, now R2 dot is not going to be zero in the next time frame. Now you're going to start radially going in this direction, you're going to have R2 dot not equal to zero. And remember, it also moves in this direction too. So now your theta 2 dot is not going to be zero. So now your uh, inner frame started to get both of its degrees of freedom. Okay, now both of the degrees of freedom are activated. And now if you go back to equation 4, if you go back to equation 4, what's going to happen? Now in equation 4, this term is not going to be zero anymore because there is both r dot and there is both uh, r dot and theta dot. And when an object, as you know, is uh, having a, tra a linear transformation as well as an angular, uh, not transformation, translate a linear motion and an angular motion at the same time, there is always going to be a Coriolis force. So you see now the Coriolis force is activated from this point on. Okay. So that means also 2m2 r2 dot theta 2 dot is now not equal to 0. So you have now a Coriolis force.
that is not equal to zero. And this is the force you are going to sense. How? I'll tell you. But this force is what you are going to sense. Okay, so this direction, theta 2, or E theta 2, is your sense direction. And your goal is to sense this red force. Okay? And I'll tell you how. But let's keep on going. So, so far, we see that 3 and 4 are everything in 3 and uh, in, in 4. The centrifugal is uh, activated. You have R2 dot and everything. Now what happens? When R2 dot is not 0, in the next time point, when you integrate it one more time, now what happens is your R2 is not going to be 0. Because your R2 dot is not zero, so your R2 is going to change. When R2 is going to change, what does it mean? It means that now this point here is going to go up. When this point is going to go up, even if this other end, which is R1, is not moving, now spring forces K2 are going to be activated and they're going to apply a force to M1 in the uh, upward direction. So now this force is not going to be zero anymore, which is the same as this. So now the springs are activated when this guy is not zero, even if this one is zero, because theta 1 dot is still 0, now our 1 double dot is not going to be 0. Okay, do you see that? So now that means the force 4k uh, times r2 minus r1, and I guess it was 4k, what? 4k2. So that force is not 0. That means your R2, R1 double dot is now not zero. Now you have to go to the next time point. Now R1 dot is not going to be zero. And that means in the next time point also, your R1 is not going to be zero. So now your R1 starts to move. Now you have activated the proof mass. Now the proof mass is starts to go up and down. It starts to oscillate. Okay? So now in equation 1, now this guy is not 0. So R1 is not 0, right? This one is not 0. This one is still R. So R1 dot is not 0 anymore. So how does uh, the proof mass starts to oscillate as well in the theta direction, right? How would you get this equation 2 activated or theta 1 double dot not equal to 0? Well, from this equation, if you start from rest, uh, theta 1 dot is always going to be 0 because there is no other excitation forces. There is no force on this proof mass in this direction to make it move in the theta direction. In the theta. But in reality, there is. In reality, although these masses uh, look like only in the R direction, these are springs, sorry, these are springs in R direction, but they also have a little bit of stiffness in this direction too. So if this mass comes here, these springs have to deflect like this, right? They have to deflect like this. A little bit. And when they deflect uh, in the transverse direction, they will apply some forces backward. Because if you consider them like a simple beam, right, and if you displace it in this direction, you know that it is going to apply a force back in this direction, right? So, although they are not super strong for the bending and deflection, still they have a little bit force. Now, that force is not comparable to K2 times R1 minus R2 or R2 minus R1. So, these springs are mostly compression springs. Their forces in the compression and extension are really large. 
but in the bending they still have a little bit of what a little bit of uh, forces the same for these k1s although the major force that these k1 springs are applying in in the theta direction but when mass m2 goes up like this they have to deflect as well so they will apply a little bit force in this direction as well okay so um here, this K2 forces, there is some non-zero force here, some small forces that is not equal to zero. And when that force is there due to R1 motion, now your theta one double dot is not going to be zero anymore. Okay, so as soon as your R1 is not equal to zero, you start moving, as I said, for this guy, you start moving basically, or a theta, um, theta two not equal to zero. When theta two is not equal to zero, so this uh, inner mass and the um, proof mass are moving in the theta direction with respect to each other, right? So theta one equals zero, but uh, theta two is not equal to zero. So in this direction, they move with respect to each other. That means these guys have to deflect and they apply a non-zero force. So if we go back to our simulation, as soon as theta 2 was not equal to 0, which is uh, right here, right here, theta 2 dot was not 0. That means here, theta 2 was not equal to 0. Right here, you can assume that your theta one double dot is also not equal to zero. So if you go to the next time point, your theta one dot is not zero. Okay, and if you go to the next one, you can assume that your theta one is not equal to zero as well. Okay, so now if you come back to equation number uh, two, now, uh, also, this term here, this Coriolis term, is going to be activated. 2m1r1 dot times theta1 dot. Now, that guy is not also 0, which happens here, right? Because now your theta r1 dot is not 0, theta1 dot is not 0. So, clearly now, your term 2m1r1 dot theta1 dot is not equal to 0. So you see now the Coriolis force acting on the proof mass is also activated. But this is not of so much importance. What matters is the radial displacement of mass M1. What matters is R1 really more than theta 1. It's R1 that matters. Why? Because if you look at equation 3, if the um, spring force here, this spring force does not exist, or R1 is uh, not different than R2, right? Or these springs are either don't exist or extremely rigid, so these two are the same, or this whole term becomes zero, then the only force acting on R2 in R2 direction is this centripetal force, and it's always radially outward. So if this spring does not exist, what happens physically? This mass is going to go, right, radially be attached all the way to here. So it's going to go and will be like this. And it doesn't come back again anymore. Okay, so this guy goes there. And this guy also goes all the way here, this one, and stays there. So they go and radially attach to the outer end of the um, uh, outer mass, the uh, attached mass M3, and they are not going to oscillate radially in and out. The reason these two are radially oscillating is because of these springs, the force of these springs. That is the force that makes the um, uh, inner frame which is to be sensed that guy make it to go up and down okay yes because if as I said the proof mass and the uh, inner frame are attached all the way to here and don't move now your R2 double dots and R2 dot are going to be equal to zero 
it doesn't move radially, when that happens, then your Coriolis term is going to be equal to zero. And when Coriolis term is zero, then basically what happens is as over time your theta two dots uh, catch up with theta three dots, okay? So over time, as time goes on, especially in this uh, kind of uh, gyros, these springs K1 are quite a bit strong. So over time, your theta two dot is gonna catch up with theta three dot and your theta two double dot is gonna go to zero, okay? And what happens is now your theta 2 is going to be constant. Your uh, theta 2 dot is going to be constant, I'm sorry. And it's going to be the same as theta 3 dot, as I said. So now your uh, inner frame is going to spin almost the same rate as what? The same rate as the uh, outer frame. If that's the case, and if these theta two the dot oscillations are not that important, so the average of theta two dot and theta three dot are the same, what happens? This is zero, this is zero, so this guy is gonna stay a, a constant number uh, close to zero, right? Only if R2 and R3 are different, this guy is going to be non-zero, otherwise this is going to be very close to zero, and when that is zero, that means this uh, displacement in this direction is not going to change. So in the theta direction, the relative position between uh, the inner frame and outer frame is also going to be staying the same. And then what? Let me tell you now about the sensing mechanism. How does this guy sense anything? Right, the sensing happens from these uh, tongs and these electrodes. So here there are charges on both of these guys, one that is on the inner frame, one that is on the outer frame. There is charge, like for instance, this is positive charge, this is negative charge. So the area between these two acts like a capacitor. and it has a capacitance C. So if there is this displacement between uh, the inner frame and the outer frame, this distance is gonna change, this distance D is gonna change. When that D changes, the capacitor capacitance is gonna change. And it's from this capacitance change that we can what? We can uh, sense this D motion. And what is this displacement D? That is exactly this guy here. That is exactly this one. The relative displacement in the theta direction between 2 and 3. So when that guy changes, the capacitance is going to change. How? You know that the capacitance of a capacitor equals what? So C equals epsilon, right? Or K times epsilon naught times A over D, where uh, this is the uh, cross section of the plates. This is the distance between the plates. And this guy is the uh, permittivity of the vacuum. Now, if inside the capacitor you have a material other than a vacuum, you have to multiply it by a gain. Okay, which depends on which material is here in this gray area. If it's just air, then you just use K equal 1. Okay, so clearly the distance between these two plates changes the capacitance does change. Okay, and this is what you're going to sense. Because that change makes a capacitance change. And capacitance, as you know, is the electric charge on the plates divided by the voltage between them. So if this guy is electric charge on them is constant, when this capacitance changes, right, the voltage changes. You see here, the voltage is proportional to one over capacitance. 
and in electric components in electrical sensors is always the voltage that we measure so C is proportional to as you can see C is proportional to 1 over D right you see that C has a relation by 1 over D and V is proportional to 1 over C so clearly the voltage here is proportional to D and D is what D is this distance so your voltage is proportional to that R3 theta 3 minus R2 theta 2 now what does it have to do with omega 3 because the end goal is to measure omega 3 remember that's the end goal let's go back and look at equation uh, uh, 4 and one more time to see what is the relation as I said if the spring is K1 is a strong spring these guys if they are strong springs they do not allow much of oscillation in the uh, theta two dots direct in the theta two direction for mass um, m two. So over time, mass m two is able to catch up with uh, the outer platform and kind of spins with the same RPM as omega three. Now it's not going to be perfectly the same. So if you plot them versus time, right? Your, uh, if your omega-3 is constant, like this, your omega-2 is going to be something like that. But you can see that the average of omega-2 and omega-3 are the same. So if you say that these small oscillations are negligible, and you can say that these two are roughly the same, if this omega-3 is constant, then omega 2 can be approximated by constant that means omega 2 dot which is the same as theta 2 double dot it has to be approximated by zero if that is the, the case then the spring force here has to be equal to what to the Coriolis force so the spring deflection which is what we are sensing through voltage is going to be what is going to be the Coriolis force divided by 4k1 so what you are sensing here this um, displacement here is also the same as the Coriolis force divided by a constant 4k1 so you see your voltage is proportional to what to the Coriolis force that's why we call these guys what? Coriolis effect gyroscopes. You see how far we gone to explain why the Coriolis force is important and the voltage that they measure is proportional to the Coriolis force. Okay? So this is how these uh, simple chips using Coriolis effect, they can measure what? They can measure these... Uh, RPMs because what was RPM again here you see that uh, if you look at the Coriolis term this is the Coriolis term as we just talked about divided by 4k and what is in the Coriolis term that is important the Coriolis term is proportional itself to theta 2 dot and theta 2 dot is the same as theta 3 dot which is what you want so this is proportional to theta 2 dot over 4k1 and that is proportional to what or let's just get rid of that 4k1 right so this is proportional to theta 2 dot and theta 2 dot is a good approximation of what theta 3 dot you see so your voltage is proportional to the angular velocity of the platform you are going to measure Okay, so hopefully all this vibrations explanation was useful to you and you saw a better picture of why these mechanisms, these MEMS mechanisms are working. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll see you in the next lecture.